Good morning, Beth. I'm Pete Cooper, Director of the Aerospace Village, and on behalf of the team, welcome to the Aerospace Village at Virtual DEF CON 28. Not quite what we all thought was going to be the plan, but let's face it, 2020 is trying to throw as many curved balls at us as possible. So while we're all trying to stay safe and healthy, uh, we've got an amazing three days of virtual content lined up for you, irrespective of you being completely new to this or whether you're a seasoned black badge holder. Aviation is really a cornerstone of the, the global infrastructure and economy. Um, and while passenger safety is an all time high, the increasing adoption of connected and digitized technologies is exposing aircraft, airport satellites, and the interdependent aerospace ecosystem to new types of risks and threats. Um, and the consequences of a cybersecurity failure in a ground, air, or space based system uh, can impact human life, public safety, and even a, a crisis of confidence in the, in the trustworthiness of air travel, which could undermine economic and national security. And as those traditional domains of, of aviation safety and security increasingly overlap, the more we can collaborate to all the stakeholders ensures that we're going to be safer and sooner together. The Aerospace Village is a non profit set up and led by a volunteer team of hackers, pilots, engineers, policy advisors who come from both across the public and private sectors. And why have we done this? Because we want to build an inclusive community around the topic of aerospace, cybersecurity, aerospace security, inspire you to get involved in one of the most amazing and growing areas of research that's out there, and promote and build aerospace, cybersecurity knowledge and expertise. And through the Aerospace Village, the research community really is inviting everybody, be they industry leaders, researchers, academia, anybody interested in aviation, space security, safety and resilience, to come in, understand, learn and, and collaborate together. Uh, because empathy and understanding is going to build common ground. Um, any sort of acts and words in looking to increase division between the communities is going to undermine the efforts of us working together. So we're looking to welcome anybody and everybody who's wanting to prove aviation and space, security, safety and resilience through positive and productive collaboration. Um, this isn't just a cool topic with a huge scope of cool tech. Um, there's loads of research uh, on the topic already, but it's a global topic and it's only getting bigger and it, there's so much that uh, is out there that is great to look at and explore. Last year we had the Aviation Village at DEF CON, that was our first year, uh, and we had great activity across airports, air traffic management and aircraft, and great engagement. Um, it's all massively interconnected and interdependent, and we started building out bridges across the community and industry. Um, and since then, on the, the importance of such, such efforts, there's been some great progress. For example, international initiatives, um, the uh, UN Body for Aviation, which is ICAO, uh, with 193 member states, published late last year their first uh, cybersecurity strategy for aviation, which specifically called out that states should give adequate protection to good faith researchers. And that's more and more recognition that such research like this is a positive thing and it needs to be encouraged as well as protected. And additionally, there's also industry initiatives, for example, Boeing standing up an industry cyber technical council that actually incorporates the research and hacking community working with the team there. So this year we've evolved into the aerospace village. Aviation is critically dependent on space and, and the sector is really the aerospace sector. So yeah, we rolled into space and we've now got a security community that's stretching from Earth into orbit. And a big part of that effort this year is to ha the HACSAT CTF which is pretty much the coolest CTF that isn't on the planet, um, and more of that later. It's amazing the support that we've got this year to help put on an amazing event for you um, over the next three days. And that support stretches from uh, the USAF, DDS, CETA, Boeing, the American Institute of Aer Aer Aeronautics and Astronautics, um, both the Aviation and Space ISACs, TARNAS, Cattle Tech University, California Polytechnic, Pentas Partners, I'm the Cavalry, Rapid7, and even astronaut Pam Melroy is here, and more, um, all looking to try and give you as great an experience and uh, learn as much and play with as much as you want to over the next three days. We've got everything from topics on aircraft, airports, um, air traffic management, so air traffic control, aircraft uh, and space, everything from satellites to ground stations. 
and we've got talks, panels, uh, workshops, and CTFs, uh, and everything from beginning to advanced. So please find our website at um, aerospacevillage.org, which has got the schedule and more uh, content about what's on and what we're doing uh, both now for DEF CON and as we're going forwards. Um, and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Secure Aerospace. And finally, um, to really pull together and drive this amazing event, it takes an amazing team. Uh, and it's an honor to be a part of that amazing team. So when you're pleased floating around the, the virtual village, look out for the village leads and those team members, say hi and thanks. They are the most awesome group of people that, that pull this together. So next up are two guest speakers that are gonna help us open up the aerospace village this year. Partnerships are gonna be really important to help build out this community and build trust. Uh, between the hacking and researching community and, uh, and industry and government. So it's great to have them here speaking at the opening. So the first is uh, CISA director, Chris Krebs, and this is the conversation that I had with him. Thank you. So uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Aerospace Village, uh, and I'm honored to have uh, director uh, CISA, Chris Krebs with us to uh, help with the opening. So uh, good morning, Chris. Hey Pete, thanks for having me. Good to be here with you and the uh, Aerospace Village, formerly the Aviation Village. It's a journey. It always is. Um, so um, uh, you came to the Aviation Village uh, last year. We've got the Aerospace Village this year and, and I know that uh, you and the CISA team are working really, really hard uh, on the aerospace sector. But what's unique, do you think, about the aerospace sector when it comes to some of the challenges that we're facing across the, 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 the security perspective? Yeah, I, I think it's representative of almost everything else in the kind of almost the industrial or life safety space. Things that historically have not been connected or relied upon overly networked systems, IT systems that either touch the internet or have paths of entry. Um, that's different than it was 10 plus years ago. Uh, you know, when a, when a plane used to uh, you know, lose the, the contact with the earth, um, it also lost contact, generally speaking, with, um, with communications channels. So uh, what we're seeing now, though, is due to various customer demands, other navigation requirements, that, yeah, there, there are pathways into a plane. Um, and frankly, what's at stake? And we're really truly talking about lives here. So uh, you know, when I look at, at, at both aviation, but more broadly aerospace, um, it's not just about the, the things that are moving around in the air, it's the things that are, that are going through uh, the infrastructure it's, uh, itself. You know, look at what's happened here in the US over the last year or so, it's the establishment of Space Command. Why? It's because the space-based infrastructure uh, is that critical to just day-to-day -day operations when you talk about PNT, when you talk about uh, satellite-based communications, it really is a, uh, incredibly critical slice of not just our infrastructure, but of frankly our economy. So, do you think that the the threat actors are, uh, are different to the other sectors, or a, 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 is this still the same sort of threat environment that we're looking at here? Well, I do think that there are a couple different things you got to think about with the threat actors. So, yes, there are absolutely threat actors that are focusing in on this this aerospace ecosystem and and not that it's been a steady state thing i think it's it's increasing your your their understanding the ability and the capability particularly when you talk about functional disruptions um, you know the future of warfare is not necessarily going to be on the planes of europe um, the the first strike capabilities that you would see launched through a through uh you know against our infrastructure things we need to be thinking about and and that's you know from a from an elections perspective, election infrastructure perspective, that's what I've been talking about now for years. What was so dramatic or significant about the 2016 interference with the, with the US election was it was almost a Sputnik moment. Take us back to 1957 and the Russia or the Soviets at the time put uh, you know, Sputnik into low earth orbit. Uh, it wasn't that they got to space first, it was that they had an ICBM, they had this capability to overcome geographic distancing uh, and reach out and touch us. Why was this was 2016 the same? It was because cyber could be used as that tool to reach out and touch us and destabilize democracy. I think the future, again, 
of conflict is going to be using these, these infrastructure aspects against us to undermine our confidence, undermine our ability, or undermine our willingness uh, to, to do the things that need to be done. And thanks for that. And so it shows that really that it, this is touching on, on pretty much all the themes about trust and, and resilience across all of the other sectors as well. But for those um, that are sort of new into the, the aerospace sector, and, the, and we've got loads of researchers and hackers that are now um, uh, really engaging um, on the topic, what's the, um, the key challenge for yourselves on, on trying to look at um, the safety and security aspects of it? Because it's a safety critical industry, so we've got the FAA and also CISA in, in, the, in the frame as well. Um, can you try and help explain to um, the, the, the audience out there is actually how, how does that balance work on, on working through safety and security with the different uh, partners that are out there? So, Oh, wow. Uh, so, you know, there, there are the technical aspects of it, actually getting access to the equipment. This is not kit that you can typically just find out they're hanging on eBay. Um, so there, there are some proprietary systems that you've got to be able to get access to and, and work in, a, in an environment um, that, that's trusted. And I think that's the second aspect. Beyond the technical, it's the relationship piece and the trust, you know, it, this is, I think, that constant struggle, that constant tension between the research community and the owner operators or the vendors is how do you have an, a, an, a, an effective, a meaningful conversation about security and, and trust when you add life safety? Same things for the, the medical device community too. You know, unfettered access into a piece of equipment that has life, life safety implications is not something to be toyed with. And you, you wanna make sure that you've got open lines of communication you're not just dropping a vault onto the open market uh, without giving the, the, the folks that are maintaining those systems the appropriate time to control or to, to implement. But, but that also, you know, when you talk about these proprietary systems, uh, there are some DCMA and other issues that really restrict the ability or the access. So we have looked over the last several years to help really foster those conversations to bring the security researcher community together with the vendor community. And, it, and it's been a journey. Um, you talk about the journey from the aviation village to the aerospace village. It's really been a journey and it, I, I am so incredibly, uh, you know, impressed by a number of the, the bigger companies out there that, that, you know, a year and a half ago weren't particularly interested, for instance, in participating in the village, but now they're meaningful, full bore, full throated supporters the members because they get the kind of force multiplier aspect. I'd, I'd rather have you on my team than working against me. That sort of mentality has really taken root and uh, we're, we're you know, proud to be a part of that effort to keep driving forward. No, thanks. And, and it's, it's that, that challenge of trying to make sure the dialogue's there because the, the perspectives are different. Um, and and it, it feels like trying to fit a really small Venn diagram together and, and just getting that common ground in the middle. Um, but what do you think, CISA, I mean, I know, and, and partnering with us on the village is, is great, um, but what do you think um, we, the village and the community um, and CISA would want to be doing in the next sort of year? I mean, um, how do you think that, that that can work better across all of those stakeholders? And, and also as well, what message would you be giving to industry across that as well? Yeah, so last year, for instance, we were kind of silent partners. Um, helping, again, facilitate some of the conversations, but not uh, a financial supporter, not a, you know, really staffing supporter. We had folks there last year in, in Vegas. This year, much more engaged in the planning, bringing the partners together, working with the information sharing and analysis centers, working with the vendors. I think going forward, I really want to see, uh, you know, assuming we, and hopefully, we get through this, this current pandemic where we can get back together physically. Uh, really would love to see more practical uh, environmental environments that we can uh, bring researchers in to take, you know, start shooting holes in things, figuratively, not literally. Uh, but you know, we've been working in our industrial control systems initiatives to develop uh, environmental laboratories, so our seller program, where we've got uh, control systems environments uh, that, that folks can mess around with, that they can either conduct research on, we can tailor them to specific environments like water, but also I think aviation is a great opportunity going forward where we can continue, you know, it's almost like democratizing 
security uh, for the control system space, and including the aerospace uh, environment. It, you know, again, it's just making these um, these partnerships more accessible to everyone, and, and 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 much much more open. And again, you know, the concept here, really, more than anything, is it let's democratize this. It does not happen overnight, so we've all got to be patient, keep plucking away, and yeah, sometimes various parts of the community raise their voice and get a little frustrated with others, but keep working on it. And the more we work on it, the more trust we'll build and the more that we'll be able to do in the out years. And is this the same journey that you've seen across the other sectors as well? Um, I mean, from what yeah. we're seeing across the, uh, the research and hacker community and the dialogue that we've got with, with industry and regulators and, and um, everybody is that actually uh, this is a journey that has its ups and downs. Um, and, and it's, it's not always an easy path because there are so many yeah. different and, and quite strong perspectives out there. Yeah. Um, but but it, it sort of feels like this is a journey that other sectors have gone through as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I'll, I'll make second elections. So if somebody's got the Chris Krebs bingo card, if I don't mention election security like six times in any speech, even if it has nothing to do with election security, and I failed. Um, but election security is a great example. So in 2016, um, when, when it first started becoming apparent what the, the Russians were trying to do, there wasn't an established, vibrant uh, community of practice in election security. Yes, there was a security research uh, core team that was looking at these issues, but it hadn't really gone mainstream. You didn't really have the vendors on board. You didn't have the operators of the, the systems, the practical operators of the system. But over the last three or four years, we really worked hard to bring all those partners together and again, create that vibrant community of practice. And so as we look into 2020 election, feel much more comfortable, much better about where things are, the security state of uh, various systems. Do we, are we where we need to go? Oh, hell no. I mean, there is still work to be done. Absolutely. But by coming together, all aspects of the community, uh, we have ensured, or at least we're working towards that additional level of assurance that, that we're, we're doing the right thing, we're, doing, we're defending democracy. And um, you know, again, the 2020 we're, you know, should be the most secure election in, in history. So, so again, you gotta break it down. Like, why did we get there? Like, what led or what contributed to um, the progress we've made over the last four years? I, I kind of, you know, I've stolen this from General Mattis, who, who I think adapted his leadership style from General Washington, uh, uh, President Washington, and it, it's basically four things. Listen, learn, help, lead. So we're still, I think, in that learning phase of, of leadership and understanding the community uh, and, and transitioning well, I think, into the help space. Uh, but here in the, in the aviation aerospace uh, world, there's, there's opportunities for leadership. And so we're, we're looking at those, uh, seeing what we can do again to, to bring this community together, bring this practical uh, research uh, and sharing of ideas and information. Last thing I think I'll mention is, uh, you know, I think it, I think it goes in, in just about any other uh, discipline within the, the security research community is, 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 is vulnerability coordination. And how do you do that in a way that gives the defender an opportunity uh, to to close out any gaps before the bad guys have a, have a proof of concept. Um, we've seen it in the election space. We've seen it here. Um, you know, there there are opportunities to help the defender before advantaging the the uh, the, the offensive security side or the offense of the the, the the threat actor. So to the extent that we can continue to build those partnerships between the security research community and the vendors, I think we're gonna, again, we're gonna continue advancing uh, towards a defensive advantage position. Oh, right, thanks. And that, that touches on so many different areas. Um, yeah. I think uh, one of the things that you've been talking about there from the democratization of it, from the amount of research and hackers that we've got contributing to the village, through either breakers yards or buying stuff off the internet and things like that, and right. actually, they're doing some really great research on, on what they're finding. Um, and it's trying to make sure that those pathways exist to be able to talk about some of those findings yeah. and go through yeah. it. Um, because that then sparks a dialogue that actually allows 
um, uh, engagement to happen and actually th that progress to be made. So yeah, so there's loads of lessons across, across yeah, all of that. And to, be, to be perfectly clear here, I'm not casting any aspersions or judgment on any part of the community right now. Um, whether you're on the vendor side of the security research community, I think everybody's got, um, you know, they, they've, you know, we talk, you talk about ups and downs. Um, everybody, I think, has some, some, uh, has made some good strides forward over the last couple of years, and we want to continue making those. But it's got to be an open conversation. It's got to be uh, forward thinking and progressive. That's the only way uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna uh, get where we need to be. Yeah, and actually, and and look at the scale of the challenge. Um, I mean, you, you touched upon the elections. On if you just sort of sat back and said, um, "Let's just protect the elections." I mean, that's a massive task. If we look across the aerospace sector, with everything from airports, the air traffic management aspects, the aircraft, uh, and then space, be that ground stations or on the or the on orbit assets. Um, the scale of that is huge, and it's a massively interdependent sector as well. Um, how do we how do we scale this uh, from your perspective, looking at this nationally and also internationally with all of the international work um, you and the team are involved in? But how do we how do we make sure that we don't do this in in lily pads of excellence? Well, and that's I think that's that's exactly what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Everybody's got their uh, their normal partners that they work with. And, and that really became clear to me last year. We were going through a process working with the Department of Commerce, trying to understand across the telecommunications uh, sector, the ICT folks, um, where really the most risk lies uh, in terms of supply chain uh, vulnerabilities. Not vulnerabilities, but risks really more than anything. And what we found is we didn't have a really strong relationship with the satellite uh, satellite community, satellite industry. And it was an area that, that I think they realized as well that they didn't really know what we were doing, what our role was. So to get to those, those elements of scale, I think it's gotta be these, these broader conversations, talking both within government, but also with industry. Um, and understanding what the respective lanes in the road are. Uh, and you know, it's something I've said a couple times now, but you know, really, you know, it 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 goes back to that um, the mantra of you know to improve something, you've got to be able to measure it. Well, to really scope the problem, you have to understand who the players are and what their roles are and how we can all work together. So that's what that's what we've really been focusing on, um, in part through an effort that we we have called the National Critical Function. So it's moving away from a 16 sector based understanding of U.S. critical infrastructure but instead distilling it down to what are the, the actual services, what are the functions, really a systemic risk approach to the economy, and then identifying who the, the key providers of those services are. Uh, and in doing so, we'll get that better understanding of risk, better partnerships built, and then better solutions against the, the risks that we need to manage. And, and against those risks, um, would you be expecting um, those critical um, service providers to be working with the research community and actively engaging with that community as well. I, I yeah, I mean, look, this is this is part of our force multiplier here as defenders. Um, the security research community has proven time and time again that it it can help. Um, I am, you know, I'm in a similar situation, honestly. Um, to the security research community in a lot of respects. All the things we do here at CISA um, tend to be voluntary public-private partnerships. And, and the security research community working with vendors is, is similar, it's a partnership. So you do that by building trust, by understanding what the kind of the needs are and then putting a, a, a capability or putting a, a resource or service against that need and both sides benefit. Um, that's how we operate, and I think that's, again, going forward, that's that culture, that community that, that we really look forward to uh, being a part of, but also fostering. No, thanks. And, and I think that everyone's actually, I mean, the, the momentum that we're building up um, on all of the dialogue across the aerospace, um, security research and the hacker community is is building in a really nice way. And actually the engagement we've got from the vendors is great as well. Um, and I think it's from dialogue such as that from yourselves um, and, and the other industry leads really, it's making a huge difference. Um, and when we're talking about sort of all of the, the 
the the challenges and the scale of it. Um, how do we try to sort of not see that necessarily through a work, partly through a workforce lens, but there's a lot of organizations now that are really throwing a lot of effort now onto um, uh, securing or, or putting um, more bandwidth on their security. Therefore, how do we spin up the workforce on this from a national perspective? Because getting that, getting that crossover between aerospace and cyber security and security is really yeah. hard. Getting those people yeah. that can understand both worlds is a challenge. Right. I, you know, I think, I think uh, the ongoing conversations about the gap in cybersecurity work in the cybersecurity workforce is, is ultimately a little bit, um, it's almost nihilistic, right? It's like we're always going to fail at secure code and secure deployment. And I think you've already touched on it a little bit, but, you know, I think the more opportunities for STEM, STEAM, or whatever you want to call it, um, at the, the K through 12 uh, level is going to generate a workforce that's more technically savvy. And if we can start folding in rather than bolting cybersecurity expertise on to the after the fact and start building it in through a, through a whether it's dev, DevSecOps or, or a, a security development or a software development lifecycle, those sorts of approaches I think are what we're going to have to uh, adapt. Um, so it's not about building a cybersecurity workforce of the future. It's, it's a security-minded engineering and technical workforce of the future. Let's, let's close out these issues before we even get to them. And that's really kind of the, the mantra that we've got here at, at, at the agency. It's defend today, secure tomorrow. What does that mean? So today, we're dealing with patching yesterday's vulns, the stuff that you know, whatever company dropped. But let's learn from all these examples and figure out how for the next generation, the next iteration of infrastructure deployments, uh, we just don't make things better by design, better by deployment. Uh, let's make our lives a little bit easier. And I mean, frankly, it'd be great if we could put ourselves out of business. That's never going to happen, but it's not a bad thing to shoot for. Um, so I, I, you know, I tell you what, this is an issue, workforce education that, that's you know, personal to me. I got five kids here. Uh, in DC that, that are in the, the public education system. And I just see day in, day out, um, the kind of dearth of, of, you know, as I see it, appropriate technical uh, education. We've got to overcome that. So there are a number of, initi of initiatives that we're working here at CISA that are intended and designed to, again, overcome those uh, shortfalls. Uh, and it's not going to be about universities. It's not going to be about colleges. I don't think that's the solution. I think, again, we've got to have better K through 12. We have to have better trade uh, school type education at institutes. Um, it's, again, it's, it's about putting the tools into the hands of the, of the future workforce and not four-year or, or post-grad um, uh, programs. And last thing I'll say on this front is we also need to be smarter about the way that we uh, bring people into the workforce. And, and in part, that's through um, our hiring practices. It's through how we advertise for jobs. The Aspen um, uh, Institute cyber program last summer announced a couple different, you know, just different ways to approach hiring. One is don't overspec your PDs. Don't overspec them. Not everybody needs, you know, 15 different uh, certifications and 10 years of uh, experience for a coding language that's only been around for four. Uh, just be smart. You saw that advert as well then. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, and then, and also use, um, you know, ungendered or gender neutral terms. Uh, you know, unconscious bias is a thing. And how do we get away from that? How can we have a more diverse and inclusive workforce that diversity and lack thereof in, in cybersecurity and technical fields is absolutely a thing, and, and I think it's on us as, as leaders and voices in the community uh, to, to drive for uh, drive for, for, for change. No, and, and, and hopefully that'll be the way as we go forward. Uh, and again, it's something that we're seeing through the, the village is actually just trying to bring on that, that next generation to really get engaged on it. And, and a lot of the, the, the activity that we've got in the village is, is really at that crawl walk type activity to really have that on, have that on ramp for, um, for, for not necessarily the, 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 um, 
uh, 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 any sort of specific demographic, but anybody who wants to get involved and start right. engaging and, and learning about this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, that this is it's a it's an open and engaging community, and that's what makes it so great. So I, you know, just to kind of rip on this for a second, you know, and I think about the way that the federal government here in the U.S. hires, and it's you know, it's it's a a college degree and three years of experience, and you too can qualify for a GS nine position, um, but that sort of experience, I see kids going into college at 18, having six, seven years of code, coding experience, of, in some cases, development experience, certainly of, of, you know, research experience. So how do we bring those types and reward them for their experience and recognize that experience and not just say, oh, you don't have a CISSP, so you're not qualified. It's absolutely wrongheaded and backwards. We have to change that. And so there are a few things again that we're doing here in the in the, in the government. We're trying to change that. There's one pro. There's one um, a hiring regime that we're put the final touches on the cyber talent management system that'll do just that. It'll look for experience, practical experience, and reward that through the hiring process rather than saying you need that four year degree and you need three years of you know working in a in a call center. So we we've got a couple things I think we can do here. Um, it's just a matter of implementation. No, that sounds really great. Um, now, uh, before we move on, is there anything that, um, that, that from your perspective, um, that we haven't touched upon that you'd want to sort of like pitch out or, or um, engage with on the community around the aerospace cybersecurity? Well, I, you know, just to kind of do a self-serving promo here, uh, just on the last piece, you know, we are hiring at CISA. Um, there are a lot of positions that we have that don't require top secret clearances. Um, they're either the secret or the, the, the no, no security clearance level. I am looking for practitioners. I'm looking for people that know the community, that can work with the community. I think we have a unique offering and a unique place within the federal government that's really the closest thing to the private sector, the closest thing to the security research community. So check us out at cisa.gov slash careers. Uh, we are always hiring. There you go. Well, we don't normally do commercial pitches, but I think I'll let you have that one. <laughs> um, Chris, uh, many thanks for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us at the kickoff for the Aerospace Village. And, uh, and hopefully once we get through um, COVID, then look forward to seeing you again in person. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Pete. It's great to be with you. If I was on Room Raider, I'd probably give you about a four out of 10. You'd get probably five or six for all your badges, but your lack of art and any potted plants probably set you back a few, so. Yeah, no, I, I made sure I kicked the cat out, so I thought you'd, I'd have got a few <laughs> extra points. Thanks very much. So our next guest speaker is Dr. Will Roper, and I'm honored to have him here this morning. So Dr. Will Roper is the Assistant Secretary of the US Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Um, and he and his team, along with DDS, were great supporters of the village last year and have been again this year as well. Um, and as you can see from the efforts that we've got through the HackSat uh, CTF and, uh, and also the workshops that they've brought along to the village to support us this year, um, they've, they're showing a huge amount of passion uh, in the topic and, uh, and it's great to have them here. So, Dr. Will Roper. Hello everyone and welcome to the Aerospace Village at DEF CON 28, Safe Mode. I'm Will Roper, the head of Air Force and Space Force programs, and it is a privilege to be at DEF CON for my second year. Last year I came and was blown away by the technical talent that DEF CON has in this community of creative, inquisitive investigators of all things software driven. We brought a live hacking opportunity with one of our F-15 fighters, and yes, this community was able to get in. We were left with a lot of great understanding about how to be better in the cyber domain. And we're back this year with an amazing opportunity that's going to teach the community and us how to take good cyber practices into space. Orbiting overhead right now is a satellite that hackers are going to have access to to see if they can apply their skills to get in. They're gonna to have to understand complicated physics, how satellites communicate with the ground and how we communicate back in order to overcome this capture the flag challenge. But seeing the talent that's here, 
My money is on that they will succeed. Now, how cool is that? That winning teams are going to get to have their code run live in space. And what we'll learn is how to make this new area of defense and commercial innovation more cyber secure in the long run. You know, if you back up and you look at how the Air Force engaged, we really sat behind our high walls and fence lines and we used secrecy as a way to keep our military systems safe. That doesn't make sense in today's world. With so much technology happening commercially, we've got to get outside of our bases and fence lines and be part of this community that continues to push innovation forward. So we are here to share, we are here to learn, and to make openness and transparency part of our equation for being secure. Thank you for being here as part of the Aerospace Village. Thank you for being here to participate in Hackasat. And next year, when we're back with the next round of the thing we bring to expose to the community, I hope you'll share your thoughts about what opportunity would inspire you to help us learn how to be a better cyber warrior. For the $60 billion of airplanes and satellites and cyber technology that we produce each year, the cutting edge comes from software. Everything we learn about making that cutting edge more secure makes our men and women in uniform, this nation, and our allies and partners and all who work with us safer. So we are proud to be part of this community and can't wait to see what's ahead.